Hi everyone, welcome to week eight. I hope you all had an amazing Memorial Day weekend and that you are ready for the last couple of weeks of school, of distance learning, and ready to get through our last unit. We have just the second half of it left, just three more weeks. So this week we are going to focus on the scientific revolution. And then next week and the week after, we will focus on the age of exploration in Europe. So we are going to pop over. I'm gonna share my screen with you all. And pull this up from the corner here. And play from the start. And I'll minimize myself so that you guys don't have to look at me. <laughs> All right, so we are jumping right into the scientific revolution. We are going to complete this entire section in just this one video. Um, and then you will have the video to watch and then one assignment to do for CCP, one assignment for honors, and two assignments for my advanced students this week. So let's get started. Let's set the stage. The Renaissance, which we've been talking about for a little while now, inspired a spirit of curiosity in many different fields. So obviously we have talked about arts and entertainment. We have talked about religion. Well, now we are going to talk about science. Scholars began to question ideas that had been accepted for hundreds of years. During the Reformation, religious leaders challenged accepted ways of thinking about God and salvation. While the Reformation was taking place, another revolution in European thought was also occurring. And this revolution challenged how people viewed their place in the universe. So let's get started, the roots of modern science. Let's look at the medieval view first. During the Middle Ages, most scholars believed that the Earth was an unmoving object located at the center of the universe. This is known as the geocentric theory. Geo meaning Earth, centric meaning center, so Earth-centered view of the universe. The idea originally came from Aristotle and was expanded on by Ptolemy, and it was also supported by the church. This made sense to the church because, of course, the church said God would put humans, would put his creation at the center of the universe. It also made sense to people because, do you feel the earth moving right now? Seriously, think about it for a second. You're sitting front of your computer or your phone or your tablet, whatever you have watching this, do you feel the earth moving around? No, you don't. And because you don't feel the earth moving, you think to yourself, of course the earth doesn't move. This was why so many people easily believed the earth was this unmoving object. You couldn't feel it move, it must not be moving. Well, this way of thinking did not prevail for long. Beginning in the mid-1500s, a few scholars began to challenge these long-held ideas, and this launched a change in European thought. This is known as the scientific revolution, a new way of thinking about the natural world. A combination of both discoveries and circumstances, for example, the fact that the Renaissance had already been occurring, led to the scientific revolution. The age of European exploration would push this scientific research even further as time went on. And scientists began to develop new tools and new instruments in order to make these more precise observations. They could do more and research more and study more because they had better tools to do so in the mid 1500s than they had say 500 or a thousand or even 1500 years before. Well, the first major challenge to accepted scientific thinking came in the field of astronomy. 
the scientific revolution began when a small group of scholars began to question the geocentric theory, that Earth-centered view of the universe. In the early 1500s, Nicholas Copernicus began studying planetary movements, and he developed the heliocentric theory. This was his theory that the sun was at the center of the universe. He said, not the earth. In the 1600s, Johann Kepler concluded that mathematical laws manage planetary motion. So he confirmed what Copernicus had started to show to the rest of the world. Then in 1609, a man named Galileo Galilei created his very own telescope and he began to study the stars. Well, when he began to study the stars, he learned some things. He was able to make observations based on what he saw and those findings frightened church leaders. The church was afraid it would lead to further questioning. If the church had been wrong about this, what else could they maybe be wrong about? The church was already in the process of dealing with the Reformation and the amount of people that had left the church, the Catholic church during the Reformation. And so the church was afraid this would lead even more people to question, to leave, and they didn't want that to happen. And so the church forced Galileo to take back his support of Copernicus. But that did not stop the scientific revolution from occurring. This is not science class, and we are not about to start a science class, but we do need to talk about the scientific method. I know your science teachers have talked to you about this for years, but we are going to talk about it very, very briefly. What is the scientific method? Well, it is a logical procedure for gathering and testing ideas. It begins with a problem or a question that arises from an observation. So maybe I make an observation that one of my students, maybe you, is not doing their homework that I have been sending home for distance learning. They are not responding to my emails. So now I have a problem, a student not doing distance learning work. Well, I need to do something about this. How, what is the best thing that I can do? Well, I'm going to form a hypothesis. Maybe if I reach out to your guidance counselor, your guidance counselor may be able to work with me and with you so that you will turn in your distance learning work. Okay, let's test it out. So I reach out to the guidance counselor. I say, hey, my student and your student are not completing distance learning work. Can you help me reach out to them? And the guidance counselor says, yes. So I have conducted this experiment. I have, I said, maybe talking to the guidance counselor will work. I talked to the guidance counselor and it turns out that the guidance counselor was able to reach the student and together the guidance counselor and I caught the student up with the distance learning work that they had missed. So, I can see that my data is analyzed, reaching out to another person, the guidance counselor helped in this situation. Now, if it didn't help, I would just form another hypothesis and I might try that out instead, talking to a parent, talking to a dean, trying to reach out to a student in another way. All different hypotheses that can be tested until a conclusion is reached. So where did the scientific method come from? How do we get the scientific method? Well, these two men here in these pictures here, these lovely men, Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes, helped to advance the scientific method. Bacon was not a scientist. He was, however, an English politician and a writer who had an interest in science. And he urged scientists to experiment. He said, don't just take every single thing at face value. Practice it, try it out, see what happens, experiment with your ideas. And Rene Descartes was a French scientist who relied on mathematics and logic. He used the scientific method in order to conduct experiments. 
Another man who helped advance the scientific revolution is Isaac Newton. He is an English scientist who brought together previous ideas into one single theory of motion, what we today call the law of gravity. The law of gravity says that every object in the universe attracts every other object. Oh, oh. sorry about that, folks. Let's jump back in there before we end that quickly. Almost done. The law of gravity says that every object in the universe attracts every other object. So essentially what comes up must come down. And that is because if you throw a pen in the air, it will land back down on the ground because the pen and the ground are attracted to one another with a certain degree of force, which causes it to come back down and to hit the ground. So what goes up must come down. These three men, Newton, Descartes, and Bacon, are huge advancers of the scientific method and the scientific revolution in the mid and later parts of it. Now we will stop our screen share. Sorry about that confusion there. And you are going to head over to the work that I sent to you. Again, CCP and honors, you each have one assignment and advanced, you do have two assignments this week. If any of you have any questions at all, please let me know, send me a remind text or an email and I will help you out as best as I can. I, again, I hope you all had a great weekend. I hope you're staying safe and doing well with your families and that you all have a great week.